Hey everyone, how's it going? Hello. Hello, hello. Uh, so hi all, we are here to welcome you today to Yola National and uh, more specifically to the Pathway Exploration Series. I am super honored uh, to be here with this fabulous cast of people. Um, so, give me one second make sure that we're all set up technologically here. Um, so just to give you all a sense of what we're doing here, um, Pathway Explorations is an opportunity for folks to hear from people in various career pathways in music, uh, but also to hear a little bit about uh, identity and how identity intersects with the work that we do as classical musicians, as administrators, et cetera. So I'm here to just to introduce you to uh, our hosts and our panelists. Um, our hosts are from Classically Black Podcast, which is uh, at least one of my favorites. Uh, I wanna say welcome to Delaney Harris and to Katie Brown, who have put that show together. Thank you both for being here today. Uh, and also to our, uh, to our host panelists, uh, Kenneth Brown and Jacqueline Rodriguez. I wanna thank you two for being here as well. Uh, I'm gonna pass it over to you two and uh, we'll be monitoring the chat. If you all have any questions, please feel free to plug that in. Same thing goes for YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, please feel free to use the chat function uh, to ask any questions. And we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes at the end uh, to answer some of those for you all. I'll pass it on over. Take it over, Delaney and Katie. All right. Hey, y'all. I'm Delaney. I'm a bassist and an alumna of Yola, uh, wrapping up a degree in double bass performance from the Eastman School. And it's Katie. I'm a violist and recent graduate of the Eastman School of Music, where I got a master's degree in viola performance, music education. And I'm currently a fellow with the Memphis Symphony Orchestra. And we're the hosts of Classically Black Podcasts. Where we talk all things classical music and being Black in the profession. With trap beats playing in the background. <laughs> OK, so you may be wondering how a little Black girl from Inglewood, California, who loved pop rides and a baby, ended up at the Eastman School or how a black girl from Chicago who started playing viola late and equally loves Cardi B and Head Skywalker ended up at the Eastman School of Music. <laughs> but the reality is that we leaned into the ways that our black intersected with classical music during our college experience. And after noticing a lack of community among black, black classical musicians in our environment, we created Classically Black Podcast. Where we gas up black classical musicians, we highlight black composers, Dan Tchaikovsky, and we talk about issues pertaining to Black classical musicians. We're so excited to be here today with Jackie and Kenneth to discuss how they incorporate aspects of, our, of their culture into their artistic pursuits as college students. All right, so we're kind of going to go in chronological order um, and get, we're going to go from where y'all started to where you are now. So first, uh, Jackie and Kenneth, whoever wants to go first, can you start off by telling us where you're from um, and your background and how you got into music? Um, I'll, I'll go first. <laughs> um, so I born and raised in South Los Angeles um, and my music career actually started at um, my elementary school when I um, wanted to join choir and we sing um like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer like all the little you know all the little <laughs> jams and um after that my music teacher realized that like I really had a um I had something special for music and she, that was right when um Yola was starting back in like 2009 2008 maybe um and so she recommended Yola. Um, she recommended Yola. And after a year of like being in choir, I, I joined Yola and um, going through musicianship, going through um, all of the process that took to get to an instrument at Yola, I ended up choosing the cello. My mom was so stuck on me choosing the violin, but I was like, no, that is not the instrument for me. <laughs> and um, I was, um, I always knew that I wanted to do, do cello, like once they introduced all the instruments to us um, after we were done with musicianship. But um, I was like, OK, she, she didn't want me to do, choose cello because she's like, no, it's too big. It's going to take up too much space in our little apartment. But um, 
I was like, okay, I'm going to choose the flute, like compromise. Like I'm not going to choose violin or cello. But after uh, I, I had began like, even before classes started for flute, I was like, no, mom, 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 I, I'm, I don't actually want to do flute. I want to do cello. Please. Can we like switch to cello? And um, we talked to the program director and luckily they still had a spot. Um, they had a girl who was in the cello class who wanted to do flute. And I was like, so we just did the switcheroo and um, I started playing cello. And then 10 years later, I graduate. Um, I just graduated last year um, from Yola. And through that whole journey at being, being at Yola and being able to attend all of these like different music festivals like Yola National and being a part of, I don't know, just all of these different programs and knowing all of these different students who had the same passion for music. And not only that, but had like, they were also coming from nonprofits. Um, that's kind of where I knew my like field of work wanted to be. I, I mean, I love music and I also admire all the people who are, um, like following that path of becoming professional musicians. And I, as much as I wanted to do that, I felt like my place was was a lot better being a facilitator. So being that bridge for the students who were um, coming from these places that were, that didn't have as many resources or and whatnot and like helping them become those professional musicians and helping them envision themselves as those people. Um, and yeah, so I started uh, the ethnomusicology program at UCLA, um, specifically their public ethnomusicology program. Um, and at UCLA, I'm doing, um, well, ethnomusicology is essentially like the study of all world music. So um, my first quarter at UCLA, I did music of Persia. Um, and I've been doing music of Mexico, which is something I'm kind of I'm, I'm really interested in and but with pu public ethnomusicology is essentially like building the road to become an arts administrator and, and a music education administrator so yeah it's it's been fun and interesting so Kenneth the mic is all yours <laughs> thank you so much there oh uh, Jackie um so my musical journey it started as young as two or four, just coming over to my grandmother's house and playing on the piano. I didn't realize, I did like many things. So I did sports um, as well and I did other things too. But when I started around eight or nine years old, that's when I started uh, picking up the trumpet. And the reason why I picked up the trumpet is because during my third grade class, we read this book called Trumpet of the Swan, if you heard of the book. But as well for a deeper context, I wanted to play trumpet because it allows me to give me, to amplify my voice, um, not just for myself, but for others, my family, my friends, the people who I play for. So I started at this program called the Southeast uh, Symphony Association. And during my second year there, um, I had really the honor and the privilege of studying with um, the father, Kamasi Washington, uh, Mr. Ricky Washington. I'm not sure if he's out there, but um, I hope you're watching this, Mr. Washington. Um, then in 2012, um, I joined ICOLA under the direction of Charles Dickerson and my godfather recommended me to do it. And that's when I met Delaney about a year later. <laughs> and really, um, ICOLA, um, like Yola, is a great program. Um, Mr. Charles Dickerson is also a great leader as well. And really through Iceola, I had many opportunities to play at Dizzy Hall about, I think 10 times, I lost count around like the eight or nine mark, but I would say, let's say 10 times as a baseline. I think- Y'all out here popping, y'all are here. You know, it's just going too fast for me. Besides like, Unrelatable, but go ahead. <laughs> 
besides that, uh, playing in front of government officials as well and playing in front of many celebrities as well as playing um, at Dorothy Channel Pavilion, which is like right across the street. Um, but throughout my school experience, my grade school experience, um, my elementary school nor my middle school didn't have music programs. So Sasa and Iceola were there as a supplement, as a substitute. During my high school years, um, I went to Bishop Montgomery High School during my ninth grade year. Then I transferred over to the Academy of Music and Performing Arts at Hamilton High School, and I graduated in 2018, which is two years ago. And now I'm currently a rising junior at Morehouse College as a music performance major with an emphasis in trumpet. And I'm, I'm part of many ensembles, so I'm a part of their marching band, which is known as the House of Funk. I'm a part of their jazz band, and I'm a, as well as part of their symphonic band. I'm also in a band outside of that um, with Akil Dawood, who's the son of this famous R&B duo called Kendra and the Family. So we've been playing at at least four shows before uh, COVID hit. So yeah, and I'm studying with, um, I'm not sure many people have heard of him, but I would definitely look him up. I'm definitely studying with a trumpet teacher named Melvin Jones, who's a great trumpet player. It is on right, much respect to Mr. Jones, as well as much respect to uh, Dr. Uzi Brown, who's the head of the department at Morehouse College. So really, um, going to Morehouse particularly has been one of the best decisions of my life. I just want to I just want to jump in. Can you tell us what type of school Morehouse is? That's very Period. important. What, what type? So, Morehouse College is an HBCU as well as a liberal arts school. Ooh, and HBCU stands for Historically Black College or University. Um, yeah, but I think, I mean, I just want to point that out because I feel like, especially in this conversation about, um, especially in classical music spaces and in institutions like LA Phil, like Yola, historically Black colleges are not in the conversation because, um, I mean, the culture, not even just the musical culture, but the culture period is so, is different at HBCUs and it's very rich. Um, and I just, I'm so happy to have both of you here and I'm happy to have, you know, both of you or rep representing uh, something, you know, that may not be at the forefront of the conversation of classical music, historically black colleges, okay, and ask, musicology. <laughs> no, go ahead. I'll something too, real quick. Um, like athletes and really black musicians alike, um, I think going to HBCU could really shift the culture, especially in times like these mm -hmm. right now. So yeah, I just wanted, I wanted to go to HBCU, particularly Morehouse, um, because really my father graduated about 30 years ago, um, as well as studying with a Pacific teacher, but also representing my family, um, my people as in, you know, African Americans, as well as being champ, as well as being a champion for them, not as like the champion, but like the many champions, like we are the black kings and queens. Here you can. <laughs> Okay, so I know we, we alluded to it just a little bit, but can you just tell us a little bit more about your musical environment? What did it look like before college, especially in regards to seriousness and rigor? Uh, Jackie, you can go first. Okay. Um, at first, like, being a 10-year-old, I, like, I liked playing music, but I didn't know, um, like, to the extent of where it would take me or what would happen, I think, also being a first gen college student and just being a first generation immigrant in, in general is that's also another thing like my parents were very no you have to get a practical job and you have to you have to make sure that you're getting enough so that you can not stay in the same situation as us when you're older and so growing up with that mentality I was like no music isn't a practical job music isn't a practical job and um that mindset definitely started to change when I was getting to high school and saw all the different, like being a part of all the different opportunities. Um, like we took a Yola Cal tour, we did Super Bowl, we did um, being a part of the symposium and being a part of all of these different conversations about music education and all the different um, like routes you can take as a musician and as, a, as an educator. I was definitely, that's definitely when I started taking it more seriously and starting applying myself more and started being more disciplined with my with my music studies. And um, I didn't have my first private lesson until I was in 
sophomore year of high school or ending of sophomore year in high school. And that's because I, I started looking for things myself. I, I started a fellowship um, or I was one of the first fellows at the Colburn School of Music for Fortissima Fellowship um, founded by Jasmine Morales. Um, I, I love you, Jasmine. Uh, I don't know if you're watching this, but <laughs> um, she was definitely one of the first to help me envision myself as something more than just um, more than just a musician. You know, there's it's such a bigger role and um, being a woman of color, being um, first gen, you know, it's not something that you hear all the time. And um, there are definitely people in my life that I've met and Giovanna Clayton, she's a part of the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra and um, she's a Latina cellist. And when I first met her, it was just like, it was so eye opening. And um, yeah, that's, those were moments in my life where I definitely started believing that I could do it and that I had a place in this very large and like vast, um, like uh, the world of classical music, you know, and it's, it, it was very scary. And um, just thinking like, what if I don't make it, but it's, it's finding different ways to get to the place that I want to be. And that's definitely being the facilitator, being arts administration. And because all of those behind the scenes jobs are the ones that make those places for other people possible. And um, they're sometimes overlooked. And sometimes it's like, oh, if you're not a professional musician, that's it, you can't make it. But there's so many different routes and ways that you can still achieve what you want and still help other people while also being in that environment of classical music and just music in general. Um, but yeah, after high school, um, it was kind of like applying to colleges. I was like, well, I don't really know what else I wanna do other than just like music um, because it had already been more than half of my life. I had already been doing music. And um, yeah, that was a tough conversation having with my parents. Like, so I'm gonna, um, you know, I'm try to be uh, go into music. And I still think that that can be a hard conversation with people who aren't a part of that world and who aren't, um, or who just haven't explored the world of music and the world of classical music. Um, because they're like, oh, what do you want to, what do you want to do with that? Like ethnomusicology, what is that? But um, I definitely think that just having that conversation is so much already. And um, they're like, oh, you're not doing like chemistry or you're not doing like pre-med. I was like, no, I, I'm I'm doing ethno and, and I'm really proud. And there's only eight of us um, incoming freshmen. There were only eight ethnomusicology majors. And I wear that with like so much pride and joy. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's been, had the journey with that and dealing with all the other um all the other like barriers of yeah being first gen but I mean it's happening and I'm, I'm happy to be in this place and helping it helping making that way for other people too yeah I think a lot of people can resonate with that your parents are like so lawyer right and it's like you, <laughs> I think you, especially like I resonate with you. I'm not necessarily first gen, but my, my family was born in Jamaica. And it's like, I spent a lot of my time thinking I was gonna be a dentist, you know, but you, when you get into music, you realize there's so much stuff. It's not just being an orchestral musician. And certainly I'm a little bit on that path, but there, there's so much, I mean, we have a podcast, you know what I'm saying? Like there's so much you could do with classical music and people who are outside of that field just don't really understand that. So it's about, especially like young people, like really doubling down and be like, no, this is what I want to do because you're the only one who's an expert at that. You, you go to rehearsals and you see people have podcasts and you see people are starting their own organizations. Like, you know that you are an expert in classical music from studying it all these years. So, uh, you know, double down at that, you know, I was having a conversation with one of my sorority sisters and she was like, I thought you were a starving artist. And it's like, who told you that? <laughs> you know, so I, I really resonate with that. And I'm sure a lot of people here resonate with that as well. Yeah, I think especially like, it just goes to show you just gotta have like that 
that confidence in yourself to, to mm-hmm. be like, I know what I'm doing. Because like, I remember right. one thing Katie told me one of her sorority sisters was like, you still playing the viola? I thought you took that up for school. She's like, <laughs> <laughs> my career. Like, you know, so like people from the outside looking in, it's like, what y'all doing over there? But like, you know that, you know, the, the stuff that we do as musicians, it certainly makes a difference. And I mean, to, to even be on that path, like to be, cognizant of that um of like how your identity is going to fit into your college experience before you get there it's something that I, I certainly didn't have I mean I didn't think about how I was going to how who I was um was going to interact with the school I was going to so like for you Kenneth to be like I want to go to a HBCU um because I want to be you know a champion of black music and, and for uh for black musicians and then for you Jackie to to, to um, be like, I want to study ethnomusicology, which I'm not going to sit here and act like I knew what ethnomusicology was in high school. <laughs> I, mean, I, took, I took a little class or something to undergrad, but uh, you know. Yeah, like, I mean, I got to Eastman and I was like, oh, okay, okay. But like, okay. before that. <laughs> right, like before <laughs> college? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> like, period. Go yes. ahead then. I was like. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, I, I want to ask Kenneth, uh, I know that you both kind of touched on this, but like, could you tell us a little bit more about that that kind of transition high school to college like when did you know that you wanted to study music and um and how did you sort of deal with that if you had any pushback or any uh, complications in terms of like parents or or friends who didn't necessarily understand why you wanted to do what you wanted to do or or, or where you wanted to go um my parents were really open for me studying music because the they, saw, they kind of <laughs> saw this since I was little, mm-hmm. so I, as much as between the ages of four to eight. Come on, prodigy. My mom right. always said that I used to say as a toddler, I always wanted to play music in order to make people happy. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of pushback, it wasn't pushback from my parents nor my family members. It was sort of, for me, it was self-doubt. Because it was like, okay, am I good enough you know, to do this? And really, at um at Hamilton, there are there are like a lot of musicians, there are a lot of performing artists, aspiring performing artists that are just that good, you know, and you're surrounded, you know, by that environment. And it, it really it was um during that time transitioning between a Catholic school to performing arts school, it was kind of hard for me musically and phys- and uh, as well as physically to fit in, but I fit in right on time. Um, to be honest, and I really thrived in that environment a lot, even though there were, you know, trials and tribulations along the way during those three years I was at Hamilton. But once I got from there to Morehouse, it wasn't musically; it was a, it was a, it was a great shift. But in terms of a cultural shift from West Coast to East Coast, from majority to HBCU, it was, um, it was really a troublesome and yet gruesome transition. Because I started my educational experience at Mars through a summer program um, a semester prior before I actually started my freshman year. So I was still acclimated with the campus, but you know, between the March of band rehearsals during that first semester and really just classes, because I was taking, I think, 16 or 17 credit hours during that time, um, it was um, it was like a, it was a huge culture shock for me. So once I got the whole game down by my second semester, you know, everything started to turn around and my GPA, you know, kept increasing. I became more confident in myself and my abilities, as well as me making Dean's List this semester. Thank God. Oh, shoot. Yeah. I didn't know he was around. But <laughs> right, embarrass me. Fine. Right. Embarrass me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to flex on y'all. I really don't. <laughs> nah, flex, period. I'm just saying, like, Kevin Garnett always said anything's possible. That's really true. Mm -hmm. Um, But as well, like if you, let's say, let's say if I talk to my 16 year old self or let's say my, even some, let's say like my younger self, like if I told him those exact things, he would sort of believe me, but he would be skeptical about it. But he'll be like, yeah, we'll see. But yeah, anything's possible and God is good. And you just got to put the work in. No matter what, just put the work in. 
I mean, yeah, you said like, am I good enough? I feel like that's a, a very dangerous question for us. To, I think a lot of us ask ourselves that in classical music. Classical music can get very dangerous mentally if you let it. And that's a question I ask myself all the time. But that thing about hard work, like period, like it doesn't matter. It's as cliche as it sounds. Honest, all you gotta do is be consistent and work hard. Like I would not, a couple, two years ago, I would not tell y'all be anybody's fellow at anybody's orchestra, but I kept, <laughs> I kept working on those excerpts. I kept applying, I kept, and it wasn't easy of course. Cause like a whole bunch of no's will get to you but you just got to like hard work. That's not a cliche. That is not just something people say, like that is a real thing. So mm-hmm. of course you're good enough and you probably better than a whole bunch of other people you think that are better than you. <laughs> and, and it also like, it also, it also, what also goes into that is, um, I guess, like I said, kind of going, kind of exploring your options, you know, like I'm certainly not doing what I'm doing right now is not what I expected to be doing, you know, when I was a freshman at Eastman. Um, I certainly am not going to leave Eastman wanting to do the same thing that I came there wanting to do. Um, And I think it's, it's amazing for uh, young, I know that we have like Yellow National Festival students in the audience and stuff. It's it's amazing for, for y'all to get an opportunity to see these paths kind of before you have to make a decision because like right now, you in high school, you ain't got no bills, probably. Like you, you oh my just, god, you know, Enjoy. like what a life. Remember, what a life. Remember pre-bill life? Like no, I don't because I've been here so long. It's <laughs> it's real ghetto out here. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know, you really have that you have that freedom. I mean, I'm still yeah, I'm acting like I'm like I'm old and depressed. Right, I'm, I'm 21. Like just so you, thank you. <laughs> like I'm really not that old. Like I have bills, but not as many bills as I could have. But it's very, you know, once you, once you kind of get to where like adulthood is is closing on you, I think it's 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 really easy for us, especially in classical music, because we're in a constant state of learning and getting better. And okay, how can I make that better? And and you literally go to a room every week for a professor to tell you every how you could do everything better that you just spent a week working on. Like mad weird. Who else does know? that? Like you literally are doing it, so it's not really a, an environment that's conducive to you. Um, you know, exploring things or like uh, being really like secure in yourself. So I think it's it's really important to take, you know, this time to step back and be like, yo, I have the time, you know, and I have, um, I have options and I can, you know, explore what I want to do. And, and that's really something that's important in high school and also in college because you have opportunities in college that you never going to you know have again you know there's so much career development and professional development um that's accessible um in college but yeah i mean y'all are popping so y'all know that but yeah <laughs> um there's also self-realization when people are telling you you're, bec- you're on the way to become a great or you're a profession let's say bass player or violist or french hornist i think you play French horn, right, Jackie? Cello. <laughs> Cello. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay. <laughs> when you know, when some of your mentors um that you had growing up were telling you that you're all right, you're good, you're a good trumpet player, you're good this and that. Um enjoy, it. like don't let it feed your ego, but use it as a self-realization. Like for me, I remember my teacher, he gave me the Riazigo Trumper Concerto. The first movement, which is like one of the hardest movements, well, all three of them are hard. Um, as my as my jury for this semester, it felt like a long marathon, but you know, it takes just patience and discipline to just master things. And I didn't realize I would be able to play this. So I was like, I'm not really sure if I could play this or not, but I nailed it down. <laughs> for it. But yeah, just. Like I said, put put in the work. Just put in the work. It's like it's so easy to see the distance, like how how much time something could take, or like feeling like it's never ending. You know, like it, it's really hard to see progress when you're currently making progress. Like, how can you see how much you've gone through and how much you've you've grown from the point that you started when you're currently going through that? And sometimes I think that's that's something I struggle with as a musician, like, I feel like I'm never getting better, but um, like you said, like, kind of that I, you never thought you would be able to play the piece, but at the end of the day, like, 
you you put in the work you did it and um you we only realize how much we've we've gone through until like how we've how we've how much we've gone through but also like we realize how much we've endured once that all of all of that's already happened you know once we're finally playing our piece and even then even after we're like okay this is the final time this is our jury and um or this is our concert even then you're like i could have played that note better i could have played this part better there's never there's never i think as musicians we're never actually satisfied with <laughs> what we do but i think that's just a part of it you know um because if we were always just satisfied with what we did um i mean there wouldn't ever be room for growth and there wouldn't ever be um that room for like i i i can still be a better musician tomorrow and i it just keeps us hungry you know for just music and art making um delaney we kind of talked around the next one so i'm gonna skip the okay um how did your musical environment shift when you went to school i know kenneth you alluded to this a little bit because you were in marching band Listen, I'll be watching, I'll be watching HBC watching bands like there ain't no joke. You know, I'll keep it with Jackson State mm -hmm. and Alcorn and maybe so, but and also like Jackie, like how did how did your environment shift when you went to school? Oh, it was a complete 180. I started, I mean, I'd been doing classical music for 10 plus years and then arriving at um UCLA with ethnomusicology, I all of a sudden had like 30 different options of classes to take from music all over the world and um there were instruments i'd never even seen before like i took persian sitar and um people are like oh you mean sitar i'm like no setar like s-e-t-a-r and it's just, yeah it's this little like i don't have the instrument with me because we have to return them but um yeah the the professor was really amazing and it was a small intimate class with like four students and we were all just like trying to mess around with this new instrument that we had never touched before um and just being and just like not only playing the instruments but like knowing how music exists in different parts of the world and how it's not it doesn't have the same standards it doesn't have the same rules but it's all the same it's all under the same concept i guess like um we would we would sing when we would play and um we all had to sit on the ground and it was definitely different i i had just i also started playing mariachi music and um son harocho which was something i always knew i wanted to try but i didn't actually get to try until i got to to ucla and it was it was definitely a shift because in classical music you know we have everything written on the page and everything that we're supposed to do and everything that um the composer wants us to 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 do is on the page and like all these other different music like types of music and different type of um instruments it's kind of like here's the instrument and there are some rules but you can also just improvise and that was definitely like a harder thing for me to do and it still is um i've never like really had an experience with improvising or just going things off of ear. Um, and that's definitely enhanced like my musical experience, just realizing that not everything always is 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 gonna be written and not everything is gonna have a rule book and it's just gonna be like whatever you feel sometimes is just what you're gonna play. <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been really fun. Yeah. Well, you better than me because improvising. Oh, I, no, I know Kenneth be doing that. I I can't improvise. I'm a one trick pony. I need notes on a page. Notes what? on a page. Perfect. Per okay. <laughs> Specifically notes because the little squiggly thing with the yeah. Specifically notes on a page, preferably in the key of C <laughs> to A. Right. Don't give me C no lead e. sheet. I, I don't need none of that. <laughs> no lead sheets. <laughs> Um, yeah, but Kenneth, could you also speak to that? Your like how your um, musical environment changed. We would love to hear about you know your experience with the marching band and all that. Um, I'm gonna try to build up to it because I I've just been a part of like so many musical environments <laughs> where it's still point I need to talk about them because they're just they're all crucial to my development. 
Mm-hmm. So when I was with Sessa under uh, Ricky Washington, um, he basically, he got me into the world of jazz. So really like he gave me this huge, this like known jazz head to like many jazzers. I called Joyce Spermer Clifford Brown. And it just kind of started from there. I know my dad, he got me into Miles Davis before I even picked up the trumpet. And my uncle and my grandfather, they had like huge record collections. And I would just look at the cover of the records just for fun. Um, when I got to high school, at Hamilton specifically, I was in the jazz department, but I was also a part of the wind ensemble as well. Um, I really, um, as a whole, those are really two great environments because you're surrounded by people that are just really serious about the craft. Even though some people don't want to become professional musicians, they're always serious about this because it's like, I got nothing else to do. Um, when I got to Morehouse under the March band, under the direction of uh, Dr. Chatty e. Hughes, Shout out to Dr. Hughes. Um, it was different for me because I never really understood or even really got a chance to even study the HBCU marching band style, the, the show style. Like the marching bands you see out here, let's say like a USC, they're like, they're core style march band. Uh, but with HBCU marching bands, it's a lot different. It's a lot different environment. So really, during that time, during those times, I get the, I got a chance to travel to Chicago, mm-hmm. um, play in the first uh, Black College Football Hall of Fame Classic, um, as well as meeting new people, and really um, playing the HBC style of music, which is playing s- songs that are known to like the human ear that are popular right now. Like we will we'll be playing funk, we'll be playing trap music, well I mean we'll even be playing classics. Um, and that's just huge. Um, and really that experience um, from beforehand to there. So like playing at church around nine years old, uh, Mr. Washington, Isiola, Hamilton, like those experiences help me with that experience. And now I'm thriving in that experience on my own. Oh, as well as um, right now in quarantine, I'm just creating uh, content and covers of other songs, as well as um, going to social distance jam sessions. I know I had a social distancing concert. My mom always calls it the front yard group concert, so I'm going to stick with it. Um, I had that about 10 days ago. Now I'm hosting another one this Saturday. So it, I'm part, um, it's just cool to be a part of many different musical environments under many different genres of music. And I think the more, the more you make yourself flexible, and make yourself known in those type of styles. Like if you have knowledge of that and you have playing experience of that, the better off, you know, you'll be. Instead of being, you know, let's say the one trick pony, let's say you can't thrive in one, but you could thrive, you could thrive in all. You get like you can't necessarily be a master of all, but you could, but you could be really proficient in all the genres if you want to. Mm-hmm. And it's really good to do that. So that's yeah. why I call, like the young musicians out there. Don't be, don't be so boxed in the one style, like explore, just explore. Yeah. I also think the culture of classical music really, it kind of encourages that in a way. Like I feel like classical music kind of separates itself as high yeah. art and it doesn't really encourage collaboration or crossover between other genres. When in reality, there's so much crossover to be done. Mm-hmm. And so it, it, it kind of makes people feel like, you know, they're, they're neglecting classical music or they're not honing in on those skills when in reality, like it takes an incredible amount of technique and finesse to play other genres of music as well, which will help you uh, when you're uh, studying classical music. So I feel like in in a lot of ways, it's it's good to think about how classical music connects with other things. Um, And I mean, that that's something that we like, we try to do with classical black as well. Like we bring a lot of other, uh, genres and I know we did a I forget an episode we have 90 episodes out so yeah, it's a lot going on but an episode <laughs> that that we we talked about HBCU bands um and we talked we you know we talk about rap music and we talk about all kinds of um all kinds of different stuff so yeah it's really nice to to hear that y'all are both like branching out um yeah so how about 
we'll probably take questions after this one. Yeah, I was gonna say this question. Mm -hmm. Um, we just want to know, mm -hmm. like, you guys are both in your college experience right now, but um, having that experience of branching out and, and studying at HBCU, studying ethnomusicology. Um, has your career trajectory or your aspirations in the music industry changed going forward? Uh, okay, I'll start, or do you wanna go? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I think it definitely switched around in high school. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm a um, rising sophomore, so, um, I mean, that, that could still change, but in high school, I was definitely like, oh, maybe I'll become a professional musician. And then sometimes I was like, I don't want to do music at all. But then it was always that little feeling inside. It was just like, no, I actually do want to do music. And I, I don't think I could not do something in music, um, not only because I, I dedicated so much time of my life of it, but from it, but I was like, I've, it's always been a part of my life in one way or another. Um, yeah, like whether or not I was like from singing with my grandparents in the car with their little cassette tapes, you know, it was just always something that that's a part of my life. And it, it's something that I that surrounds my everyday life. And um, I think it started to change once I started discovering the different career paths I could take it within music. And um, not only that, but like meeting different people who had already been in those career paths and seeing them being successful and seeing them um, doing what they love. Uh, that definitely, that's definitely something that keeps me with my head up high, you know, because sometimes it, it's hard, like, okay, what am I, I, I can be sitting in my Persian sitar class. And I'm like, wait, why am I doing this again? And like, what is this going to help me with? But I think, it's not the fact that, um, it's not about like, what am I doing in the current time? I, I mean, that does have some some form of importance, but like, it's kind of like in the near future, I'm learning about all of these different cultures and I'm learning about all these different styles of music. Um, so I can have like an interdisciplinary like view of everything, um, but also like if I, if I'm inspired to to create my own music and compose my own music, I have all these different styles that I can grab from and um, be inspired by. So, I mean, I don't know. I don't have like composing in my in my near future, or but I mean, who knows? I, I can like one day just wake up and and uh, and want to do that. But yeah, right now it's it's being kind of like that facilitator and being an arts administrator but i mean why why should i only be like like gatekeep to one thing like we were saying like i can pursue different things on the side while also doing a career and um all while doing music so as long as i'm doing music i'm happy <laughs> can i I'm, I'm sorry. What was the? I'm sorry. What was the question? <laughs> um, has your have your aspirations or your um your career trajectory in the music industry changed um since you've been at Morehouse? Um, I don't think it has changed. It's just be, I think the vision and trajectory became more clear because I while growing up I was I had many mentors um growing up which were trumpet players. So Drew Nimmer, Brandon Phillips, Marcus Paul, all great trumpet players, all great musicians in their own right. I always look up to them no matter what. So having their career aspirations uh, with Brandon and Marcus, they, they're they in like the heart of the industry um, right now. So they've been touring with Ariana Grande, Yala Black, uh, Lucky Day, and like many others. Um, Drew Nimmer, who's a great trumpet player, very proficient in jazz, very proficient in classical music as well. And having that as like a mirror or something to aspire to be. Um, but when I got to Morehouse, then I wanna, uh, when I was studying with Melvin Jones, um, having these many conversations with him and advice, cause he 
He was on tour in Medea. He, um, he's just done many things and many accolades um, since I was like one. <laughs> so we're talking about in 2000, at, at least 2000. So having those people as mentors and as teachers, um, it makes your vision, it makes the vision of you becoming a musician and makes your trajectory a lot more clear and more transparent. But also, um, I was told this, you know, going into Morehouse, your network is your net is your net worth. I was gonna, I'm gonna repeat that again. Your network is your net worth. So that comes a long way too. Well, that's um, <clears throat> that's great because it takes us into one of our questions that we have from YouTube. Come on, the universe is collective consciousness. Collective consciousness. Yeah, the universe is on fire today. Um, someone asked from YouTube, can you speak to the importance of a support system slash network within classical music, but also outside of the music world? Oh, Jackie, you go first. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, your support system, sometimes we can easily think that that can be like our family and the people that we hold close to us. But even then, um, sometimes that that isn't the case all the time. Like, you know, we have our parents who are like, no, it's, it's maybe take some other direction. But um, thankfully that started to change once I, my family started like realizing that I was taking it more seriously and I was standing my ground whenever they would tell me like, no, you shouldn't do that. But I was like, it's it, at the end of the day, who's applying to college and who's going through all of this process and who's the one who, um, who's doing all of this on my own. And um, although it's, it's important to have that support system, it's also, um, at the end of the day, we're the ones making the decisions on our own. And it can definitely help having people that surround you tell you you can do it and um, giving you like a second opinion. Um, but also your, your, yeah, your network, if you know the right people and if you go out there on your own and look for different opportunities, you know, they're never gonna be handed to you directly. and especially if you've never put the work. Um, I was thankfully given the opportunity at Colburn because I like walked into their offices. I would always drive past Colburn and I was like, wow, it'd be such a dream to like go there one day. And one day I was just like, you know what? I'm just gonna go in there and see what's gonna happen. And I walked into their offices and like I, specifically went into the community school offices and asked for any scholarships or any any programs that um, like weren't necessarily the, necessarily the the conservatory but I was like is there any program that I can apply to and see if I can get a scholarship for so that I can attend at least one class here and they're like yeah we have um, I don't remember the scholarship name but I applied to it and I didn't get it but the office, um, the Office of the Community School and Community Outreach, which was Hasmin Morales asked me for an interview. And I was like, I, you're asking me for an interview, but I didn't get the scholarship. So what's happening? And, um, you know, that door closed, but another, another one opened for me. And that wouldn't have ever been possible if I hadn't finally decided that I was going to start knocking on those doors. And um, with that, I, I built my network around that. I, uh, all of the other Fortissima fellows are some of my close friends and they're all pursuing um, they're all pursuing some some form of music and some aren't but I think just having that same community of they're all women of color musicians and just having that community and then having all of my friends at Yola some who are pursuing music and um, people like Delaney I love and aspire so much um, to like have an ounce of what you have but um it's just amazing to see how all the people that you knew like growing up are like doing all these great amazing things within music and um i mean that can be some some kind of network and, it, and it's important but it's also just because you don't have that many contacts don't be afraid to to start knocking on those doors because that's the only way you're going to get things um and yeah, and until you start knocking on those doors, until you start talking to people, um, that's 
that's when things are going to start happening and that's when the ball is going to start rolling but yeah mm -hmm. um in terms of my network um don't be afraid to reach out to people that you don't know but also establish it as well um make sure you find mentors as well and really your network is your net worth as some people always say um but really like having mentors and having these connections come a long way um as i'm sorry i'm in my train of thought right now um <laughs> Oh my God. Um, but I mean, you, you, you touched on it before, like it, it led us really like seamlessly into this question, like all the people that you named that helped you sort of streamline your vision of what you wanted to do. It seemed like you had a lot of people who did different things. So you didn't have just like one person that's like, I want to be just like them. Like, it seemed like you had a lot of different people who are doing different things. And so you kind of had like, like a variety platter, like, hmm, I could do this, I could do that, I could do that. Like, um, it, it seems like that that kind of like helped you. Is that true? Yeah. Um, also, um, too, like, don't be afraid to get your parents to help you out as well, because your parents also should believe in your vision of what you want to do. So really, my dad, he's been helping me create my network as well, and just helping me reach out to people that he knows as well. and started making that connection that experience but as i was in my lost train of thought and what i was going to say now i got it back in my memory um now uh don't be afraid to create your own path with like with you and with uh with the lady and cave for instance like they created their own podcast they created the pathway for them and that's a great thing that's like that's major like there aren't that too many people in classical music that have a classically black podcast <laughs> Like I always told some of my friends, like you realize this is like a huge deal, right? <laughs> yeah, I think I think uh one thing that might be intimidating, like like parents are super super important, but also um, my mama don't know anybody. Okay, <laughs> so, <laughs> people at church, so it's like I think you both you both touched on an important aspect as well is creating your own network. When you keep working hard, you keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. You whatever aspect of music you're trying to pursue or or outside of music in general you you people you will find people who align with what you're trying to do i met delaney in the airport and now we got a podcast like you will align you will align with people you will find you go to people who you are afraid of and you ask i wanted to jennifer arnold she was a violist in the oregon symphony for years i'm thinking 13 seasons i wanted to her i'm like can i have a lesson best lesson i had in one of the best lessons i had in my life and that was a year ago and now i'm where i am now so it's like you go up to people where you who you are afraid of and that's how you build your network like she's in my network you know my former teachers are in my network and then through classically black i have met people but you're like i don't want to start a podcast but you don't have to do that you find people who you align with and they know people and they know people there are people i could text right now and i'll be like i need this and they they're texting three other people so I can get what I need like that's and I didn't have that overnight you know it's like you you keep doing what you're doing you meet people if they align with you you attach to them and you keep going um there's another question Delaney yeah we, we have one in the the Q&A and the Zoom that's been here for a minute um how competitive is going to music school? Uh, sometimes uh, I think of studying music as you always have to be practicing and everyone is still better than you it's okay if I jump on this first. Mm -hmm. um, a friend always told me that there really isn't no competition because if you worry about competition too much, it just mentally blocks you, you know. But I would say, don't worry about, don't worry about it. Don't worry about other people. Don't compare yourself to other people. You know, compare yourself. Your competition is only yourself. So you always compare yourself from yesterday last week, the month before, the year before, even like an hour before, like, did I get better today? This and that. Um, and just enjoy the journey, enjoy the journey. That's what I was trying to say. But don't harp too much on the future nor the past of what you did. Focus on the now and just build upon that. 
Yeah, I mean, you're certainly always going to have to keep practicing. But, I mean, Katie and I, we are very much on the same page about stuff like this. When I'm in the hallway to the practice rooms, other people playing my ears, I don't hear intonation. I don't hear town quality. I don't hear nothing. I worry about me, you know, because, it, like like I said, it's a constant, like, you're, you're constantly trying to build moments going forward. And every second you spend worrying about what, if, what somebody else sounds like, you've lost a second for yourself to improve what you've been doing. So I feel like it's just being, being kind to yourself about, you know, um, about giving yourself the, the opportunity and the, and the grace to improve without mm-hmm. worrying about how it's going to be in relation to somebody else. But, but also just to be completely transparent, like every music school is different. So if you're looking, if you know that competition is not something you want to personally by doing it it's not something I am interested in at all especially because like I know how I'm, I, I can be quite hard on myself so I don't need everybody I don't need all my peers to be hard on me as well like every music school is completely different and and every studio is different so it's going to take if you know that competition is not your thing like music is a competitive thing like everything you know um don't act like you didn't want to be line leader one day in class one week <laughs> in class like there's competition everywhere okay so it's up to you to be like, what school do I want to go to? What schools am I interested in? Okay, what about that studio? Who are the people in that studio? Message them on Facebook, Instagram. That's how you find out the environment of the studio, the environment of the school. Because every school, like my undergrad wasn't that competitive, but Eastman can be a competitive place, but my studio isn't. So it just, it really just depends on, it wasn't, <laughs> but it just depends on, uh, on what you want. For me, I think like in the ethnomusicology program, we're all really, we have a group chat together and it's eight of us and um, there isn't really, um, the environment is really growth based and like, we're all like, hey, who's taking this? And um, I think that's really, that's a really nice thing um, to have because I feel like it's different for for every school, like Katie was saying, and um, it just depends on on what you want and what you think you can endure. Um, and yeah, being at the ethnomusicology program and taking those classes has been really fun. And I definitely knew like competition wasn't my thing. And sometimes it could have been, it could be like really toxic, but um, to me, I had a different vision within what I wanted to do with music and, um, currently going through that yeah um this is a question who were the people that inspired you to do what you're doing what made them inspiring um, <laughs> let's go first again. <laughs> um it's just too many people to count um it's okay if i go like one by one i know it might take a good five or ten minutes ish but I'll probably make this the street as possible. Um, so with my mentor earlier from SESA, uh, Mr. Ricky Washington, um, who's inspired me, he always told me that make sure you divide and conquer when it's also, when it's in the terms of not just music, but also in life. And that really just, it comes a long way for me. Um, Another would be the musicians I play with at church. So I got to name them off the top of my head. Uh, Richard Turner, Jimmy Williams, Lyndon Rochelle, Devin Rochelle, Ron Roseboro, Don Bynum, Richard Sykes. Um, I practically played music with them. And even though they were way older than me, um, kind of felt like I grew up with them. And they're just inspiring me for what they do. Um, and they've been pretty much everywhere in the business, really. Um, I know Mr. Bynum, he played for Bootsy Collins. That's 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 like huge. Lynn Rochelle tour with Robin Thicke and Esperanza Spalding. That's just huge to me. Um, Charles Dickerson, Marcus Paul, and Brandon Phillips. Um, they're great musicians in their own right, and they've um they just they've done a lot for um I've, I've put in the work for like everything for for them and for me, and they've been really teaching me a lot of things. 
a lot of things when it just comes down to the business and just when it just comes down about life as well. Um, for high school, I would say some of my classmates at Hamilton High School, I can't, um, I'll probably name a few off the top of my head right now. Um, Joey Carreri, um, Infinity Street, Brandon Stennon, um, Eli Howe, Christopher Poe, Ronnie Hurd, Kelsey Kelly, um, Julian Caviedes, all those people I've uh, connected with at Hamilton High School are inspiring to me. Um, at Morehouse, uh, Dr. Chad Hughes, Dr. Uzi Brown, uh, Melvin Jones, Dr. David Marr, who's a part of the Glee Club. Like, they're all in a class of their own, as well as my father and my mother. Everybody who I've interacted with, um, they've inspired me to become who I am today. And I think without those people, I don't know where I would be. I don't even know if I would be half the man I am right now. <laughs> How about you, Jackie? Um, to me, specifically, I think the turning point into like what I thought I could do um, was meeting Giovanna M. Clayton. Um, she's a cellist at the Hollywood World Orchestra. And um, I met her over a summer at a music festival, a chamber music festival. And this is when I was still like, testing the waters I was like I don't know if I if if I'm if I'm good enough for this or I don't know if if I can actually do this and just meeting her it was like mind-blowing I she was um you know she like spoke to me in Spanish and she was also um like we grew up in the same sim similar background and um it was just it was kind of mind-blowing to me to see how open and caring she was about knowing that like I can definitely have a place in an org in a professional orchestra just in the professional music world and um I mean my music teacher of 10 plus years Amina um Hasmin Morales all of these people were definitely strong women that I had seen within the, the music world and um I mean Angelica Cortez she's on this but um all of these were different and very strong women that I had seen um, navigate their world and navigate the world of classical music on their own means and I mean they were all people that that encouraged me and, and still pushed me to the day to to continue you know making my own way and making my own path um, as I follow some direction as to what they they already have done um, but specifically my interaction with Giovanna I had just met her a summer I'd got her contact information and she had offered me lessons um but I was I was really scared of taking them I was like I don't know what's gonna happen and I took a, a lesson with her and it was really really I, I I definitely felt really inspired and then a year later or two years later um we did a concert at the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra at the Hollywood Bowl and she was my stand partner. And it was just like, oh my gosh, Giovanna, like, Gia, like what? And we hugged and we talked and I told her that I was going to UCLA, which which was um, the school that she graduated from. So it was just this really big, happy moment for me. And um, it was definitely a lot easier to envision myself within those spaces, um, knowing that there was someone who pretty much went through the same thing and um, plays not only like loves music, but also played the same instrument as me. And um, yeah, the, it was most inspiring because it was just uh, like, they were all very strong and empowered and they helped me envision myself as them, but also create my own image for myself to help other young girls and other young women who are also navigating the same paths yeah mm -hmm. so we're, we're out of time uh thank you so much you two for coming and sharing your experiences before we go just can we can you tell everyone who is watching where we can find you your yeah, website instagram whatever you can do you want to go first or? you can go first jackie Okay, so I'm actually on Instagram as Mielecita. I don't know if I um, 
where I can put that. So, um, yeah, on Instagram as Mialacita, and that's usually just like the platform that I I mostly use. Um, yeah, feel free to to follow me on there. <laughs> um, I'm mainly on IG. I'm about to put this in the chat right now, but um, my handle is at Kenneth underscore Brown underscore Music, and I'm about to put it in the chat right now. Yeah, if you can go, just put that into the chat. That'd be great. Sorry, go Delaney. No, I was gonna say you can find. I know we had a couple of questions that we weren't able to get to. Feel free to DM those to us if you if you want to do that, and we can still answer them. Um, because there were some that I certainly had an answer to in, in my head. So, um, you can find uh, Katie and I on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, anything at Classically Black Podcast. Um, and you can also email us if you want to talk to us that way at uh, Classically Black Podcast at Gmail .com. Very cool. Well, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, to our four uh, folks who are talking with you all. Uh, Delaney and Katie could not thank you enough for putting this panel together and Jackie and Kenneth. Uh, we really thank you for your honesty and, and for uh, sharing your insights. Uh, we appreciate you all. Just so everyone knows, this is part of a five-part series. So we'll get to hear um, from Delaney and Katie again next week. Uh, as well as the following week with Alex Lang. So Katie and Delaney are focusing on folks who are either in um, college right now or just after college around that space. And Alex is focusing on folks who are kind of mid-career level. Uh, and then at the end, we'll put uh, those brains together. And I think that that will be a super fun conversation uh, to listen in on. So thank you again to everyone. Uh, we'll catch you all on Thursday. Let us know what other questions you have and we'll catch you soon. Bye. 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 Thank you. It's an honor. <laughs>